it's, it's an extraordinary job. Um, the sound effects in this film are pushing the, the envelope. There are times the music does the same thing, and there's quite a, an interesting blend of the two together. Usually it's one or the other, a director or, or the uh, sound designer. In this case, it was the director. Um, will say, this scene will be music, this scene will be sound effects. And, and Paul, like everything else, every other aspect of this picture, his primary concern is that there's uh, an integration of everything that goes on in the film, the camera work, the special effects, the colors of the, the bugs themselves, and there are many bugs in this movie, uh, and the sound and the, and the music. About a year ago, he had a, his cut, the director's cut of the picture. And at that time, he, he um, called me into the cutting rooms and did a very interesting thing. Um, it, we, we would have these meetings about once a week. And he would show me, let's say, all the scenes that contained uh, love interest between two of the characters. Rather than show me the whole film, it was more like he'd say, all right, now we have this scene, and here are these two characters. Now, four reels later, we have this scene, and here's how the characters have changed slightly. There's this subtle uh, shift in their attitudes towards each other. They're, they're, you know, they're more mature now. They're growing up. They've been through a battle with the first battle with the bugs. And then you'd go to the end of the film where they finally come back together and, and, it's, uh, and they resolve their relationship. It was, he would do that with all the major aspects of the movie, every battle. Anytime there was the, uh, there are two, two sets of warriors. There are the mobile infantry. Uh, which are like the army, they're land, land units, and then we have uh, what's called fleet, and fleet is space, uh, spaceships and the people that deliver. So it's sort of like the Navy and the Marines, you know, if you want to use that analogy. Pretty soon the film started hooking up, but always with these various arcs or curves, you know, running throughout it so that it wasn't a linear in the sense that, okay, now we do this and we're going to do that, and we're going to repeat the theme and we're going to do that. Uh, it, it had, I think, more of a dimension, the way the interrelation between the way uh, this stuff was, was interacting with itself. It was the first time it's ever, I've ever um, uh, approached a picture that way. Um, not, not only that, he also has, um, if I may, um, this is a script of, of Starship Troopers. And then on the opposite side of where the script is, Paul has extraordinarily detailed notes which are his sort of rough impressions. Now, I don't know, he must have done these uh, while he was editing. And they're, they're just rough ideas. It's sort of the, some of them are very specific ideas, but it's sort of uh, an explanation of what the film is musically, you know, and how he sees it progressing dramatically. So I did have that. Um, uh, he handed me this, it's sort of like when we did Flesh and Blood. He, he was in Holland at the time, and he would fax me these pages and pages of, of ideas you know, that he was thinking about the music could, could proceed with the film. And he always would say, read them. If you think any of it makes sense, use it. If you don't, don't. I think in one scene there are 1,400 tracks of sound effects. Now, this requires, there's no way a mixer can handle that many tracks on a console at once. So it requires what, what we call the, the pre-dubbing, where they take 100 of them, I don't know, you know, 200 tracks and blend them down to, to an, another 100, and then they keep bringing that further and further down so it becomes manageable. But it's a huge task. So in the middle of, of one of these dub-down situations, pre-dub situations, there may be a sound, effects that, uh, sound effect that Paul doesn't like. And then they have to go back and pull it all apart again. Um, when you had, they had the music on the stage so they, they could see you know, how, how it would ultimately end up working. I think it was a great tool for them. And I think that may be why there is a successful blend between the two. Generally, it's we deliver the music, the sound effects, people deliver the sound effects, and four weeks later, it's all finished. When you work with Paul Verhoeven, you never have a sense that there are any expectations other than that you go as far as you can go with it and, and bring as much to it as you possibly can. That's, that's really the only demand there was made on me in the whole project, which is really rather extraordinary. I think a film that's primarily visual, primarily montage, and certainly action, or uh, science fiction, where you are trying to create a, a, a world that you know you're someplace different than Earth in a, in a time period, I think it could stand it. I wrote a letter to Paul when I, when I, I thought I was finished, uh, three weeks ago, and uh, I said it was long, tough, and ultimately extraordinarily rewarding. And that, that's really the best way to sum it up.
actually the first uh, first large feature film was was John Milius Big Wednesday. I had worked with smaller groups of instruments on other on other films uh, prior to this, but it was the first time that there was a sizable orchestra. It was 75, 76 pieces. Uh, it was also a movie about surfing, and the expectation there, I think, was that it was going to sound like Beach Boys. And uh, John always wanted it to sound like the ultimate end of the westward expansion, so it would have a western hit on it, you know. Uh, so I think there were some raised eyebrows, perhaps, at the studio when, when they came to hear the, the first day's recording, and it was um, basically orchestral and operatic and, and um, creating a mythology about surfing and utilize some Hawaiian influences, since that's where surfing was born and sportive kings and all. Um, my own fears um, were I thought I could do it, but more importantly, John knew I could. Um, so he kind of took took a lot of uh, uh, the burden of um, of my fears out of it for me. Um, he really, I mean, it's extraordinary because he stuck his neck out severely, and and um, I basically had never worked a large orchestra. I had a lot of knowledge about working with orchestras. I'd played piano concerti before with orchestras. I'd conduct small orchestras, uh, but I'd never written for one. Um, so he he took a serious leap of faith. And, and pushed me all the way. I was born in Santa Monica, so I haven't traveled very far. It's where we are now. I grew up in Beverly Hills, and I went to Beverly High, and then to SC. My mother was an actress, and my father was a director. And uh, that's how they met. She was a young ingenue, and he was her director. So they had a Hollywood romance and a Hollywood marriage. And My father directed a number of pictures starring Barbara Stanwyck, and she became a very close friend. And my name is Barbara, even though I go by Bobby. And she was my godmother and close friend of the family growing up. My father was born in Greece. Um, my mother's father was born in Greece, and her mother was born in Sicily. So uh, she was, m my mother was born in, in uh, this country. I think there was a large Greek community in Kansas City, where I was born. But when we moved to um, California, and like I said, I was six months old, I don't think that it th was very strong here at the time. And, um, and perhaps because my father, being an immigrant, wanted us to assimilate into the society, I never learned the language, which was really kind of unfortunate. It's something that I regret to this day. I think his main concern was that we become Americans, you know, and be accepted into the society. It must have weighed very heavily. I'm, I'm sort of projecting this because we never had, had that conversation. Um, there would be family gatherings, there would be the dancing, and then, of course there would be the music. I'm really not a part of the Greek community in Los Angeles, uh, nor was I ever outside of the church, I think, that existed in Long Beach. Uh, I never felt that closely tied, tied to it. I was in the School of Music at, at SC, and while I was there, I became very disenchanted with 20th century composition. Um, 
most of my musical training up to that time really was classic, classical and, and romantic. Um, Prokofiev may have been the most modern composer I'd ever studied. Um, once I got there, it was just uh, it was a different kind of aesthetic, it seemed to me at the time. Um, the other thing that was happening was the, the war in Vietnam. There was social upheaval. The, everything seemed to be changing. Um, it occurred to me that film was really the language of my generation, more so than playing another Bach uh, cantata and fugue or partita. Or it just didn't, it seemed like it wasn't really relevant. Um, granted, this is very naive thinking, but this is what was going through my mind at the time. My sister played the piano. My mother was a singer. And so there was music in the house, but it was mostly about film and theater. And uh, I just, I used to listen to film scores as a child. And I would go buy film scores, so I always really liked them. I had a nice collection of John Barry and Marconi. At the time we met, I was a cinema major. And you were drama... Sociology. Sci sociology. sociology. This person walked up to me. And said, hi, my name is Bobby. And I went, well, that's fairly forward. I think I should ask her out on a date, which she refused. And um, so we kept trying to get together for about a year, I think, right. after that. Basil was just... I kept trying to get together for about a year after that. He was different looking than the typical SC guys. I mean, they were all sort of preppy fraternity types. And in walked this guy with a pea coat on and looking very depressed and talking about chasing trains in the fog and it was very romantic. And then we started talking about film because Basil was a cinema major. And then we talked about sailing. I grew up sailing. But then I was booked, you know, for a year. So we started dating a year later. Well, initially I liked him a lot because he was different and we had a lot in common. And it was good that we didn't get together then because we each had a year of maturing. Well, she was 19 years old. 18. 18? No, you were 18. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, which is kind of bizarre when, when our, uh, you consider our daughters are 24 and 20. And uh, it's very strange for me to realize that Bobby was younger than they are now when we met. But I think our first, our first real date, oh, our first real date we went to see A Man and a Woman, which was very romantic. And then on our second date, Basil was an extra, that's how he you know, made money. And um, somebody had invited him over for a drink. So he said, do you mind if we stop by and meet so-and-so? So we went to this fellow's house and he said, um, Basil play the piano. And I turned and I said, you didn't tell me you played the piano. And I had no idea. I thought he was just a cinema student. So he sat down and started playing this amazing piano, just beautiful. And then he said, this is a piece of music I composed after our first date that was inspired by you. That was it. Finished. <laughs> it had worked before. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I was completely blown away. He just played and played and played. But he hadn't mentioned it over the year that I had known him. Yeah, and after she saw some of my films, she, she said, you know, you're, you're a pretty good director, but really like what you do with the music. <laughs> So I figured, well, her father's a director, so maybe she knows something I don't. At that time, I had completely turned my back on music. I, I had had an identity crisis, and I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And so it was really Bobby who got me back into uh, well, it's my fault. seriously considering music as a, uh, as a continuation. My experience, my background is, was considerably different from hers. I mean, Hollywood was a place we didn't really know much about and rarely came to Los Angeles in those days until, you know, you're older. Uh, so my, my, my upbringing was really much more rural in, uh, in a lot of ways. Actually, Basil's mother said, well, you know, I like her very much, but her, you know, her background is so different, you know. And She's, it truly was. And it I mean, was. It, it sounds silly. We were, what, 35 miles apart. Said, but, but, you know, uh, she grew up in Beverly Hills. The world Hill. has changed. She, she grew up in Beverly Hills, and she, you know, was part of Hollywood as a child. And, of course, here we are back in Hollywood. I, I decided right away that we were getting married. Right? I'd say I graduated and we got married right after I graduated. 69. We had a hippie wedding. We eloped. We eloped. We'd, we'd actually had a wedding planned 
at our home. We bought a house before we got married. And, uh, oh, and we lived together before we got yeah, married. In sin. And uh, somehow the pressures of the wedding and were sort of contrary to our lifestyle at the time, so we eloped and went to Big Sur and told all of our friends that if we were going to get married and if they wanted to drive up to Big Sur, we'd all meet at Nepenthe and, and then we'd go get married. So we did exactly that and we sent somebody out while we were having lunch to go find a suitable spot to be married, which was on a hillside cliff overlooking the ocean and did. Unfortunately, we all drove off and left Bobby at Nepenthe as she was changing into her wedding dress. and. Um, so she had no way to get to the like wedding. Like a sitcom. Yeah, it was it was pretty interesting. So I went to hitchhiked. Hitchhiked. I went out to PCH, and and the dress was like a hippie dress, you know. And uh, well, no, it was like a Renaissance. Dress. It was like a Juliet sort of <laughs> dress. And these um, five girls, high school girls, and there's in their mother's Cadillac, that had been at Haight Ashbury to have a hippie weekend. This was the perfect end to their hippie weekend. So I asked them if they would drive me to my wedding and be my bridesmaids. And they were <laughs> <laughs> the five vestal virgins. <laughs> right, so. and we had to walk down this hill, and um, all our friends were sort of, I would sort of slide from one friend to the other in my bare feet. And uh, we got married with dogs and a priest that is no longer a priest. And it's a hippie wedding. Our first daughter is uh, 24. Her name is Zoe, and she grew up being an ice skater with a lot of musical talent, but didn't care to pursue music. Uh, just wanted to ice skate, ice skate, and then paint. And she graduated from Bennington College a couple of years ago with a degree in painting, and but always started playing with the playing guitar and singing. And now she wants to be a singer-songwriter, and uh, she actually has a song in Starship Troopers that she wrote and Paul liked. And a, Which she is performing on camera. Right. Basil played the song for Paul and didn't say who it was. And he said, that's what I'm looking for. I like it. Who is that? And then he I said, submitted it anonymously yeah. for you know, unfair advantage. And Alexis is 20, and she goes to Reed College in Portland, Oregon. And she's a junior, but she's right, right now she's in London studying theater. So she's a theater major. So we have an actress and a singer. Mm. Better keep writing music now. These walls are about this thick and from the ceiling and there's double pane storm windows. You know, here we are in Southern California, but there's double pane storm windows on these uh, French doors. And so I, I feel, you know, like I can come down here at four in the morning if I want and not disturb my neighbors. And conversely, if they want to throw a party next door, I'm not going to know about it. So it's very important. Whereas I used to write and I had this piano in, in, my, in my studio. Um, the noise from that process and the phone calls that were generated from it, I just like needed to find a place there that I could call sanctuary, you know, um, and be removed from it. So that's when I had the, it became very clear and um, I'm not sure when this was built, I bet it was in March. It became very clear that I needed someplace else to work. You've seen my home and it's, it's a little small to stick a piano in and make this much noise. So this is completely soundproofed, and I feel like I'm, I call it the cave. Uh, I should have done some rocks and things, you know, textured rocks. But um, I think the, the creative environment is one of the most important aspects of what I do. And um, otherwise it won't happen. If I don't feel secure, if I don't feel like I'm not disturbing anyone, and if I don't feel like I'm being disturbed. Those are all really important tenets that I have to ensure that I am, can keep myself in the frame of mind. Sleeping, eating, that's not important. But having, having a place to, to work, that's really important. You listen. You listen deeply uh, inside. It's a strange process. You would think that if I'm writing a film score, I'm going... <laughs> Which I do on occasion. There's a stuck note here, um, but what it actually, when I'm looking at the page, sometimes looking at the film or reading the timing sheets that go along with the film, the sound comes from inside, and that takes what I call deep listening. And if there's any distraction, you know, coming in from the, ex the external world, I lose it. I had this framed a long time ago, and then it was 
sitting in about the same place in my other studio where it is. And John Millius came over one day and he saw it and he goes, oh yeah, that's from Conan. And I think we were working on Red Dawn. So I was pounding away and playing ideas and, and in the middle of one of these things, one of these themes that I was playing for him, he was staring at this photograph because I looked up to see his reaction, you know? And he was staring at the photograph and he goes, I get it, I get it. I said, what, what do you mean? He said, it's the wheel of pain. He said, what you're doing is like what Conan did on the wheel of pain. He's working himself out on the thing. I said, yeah, that's it. So that's the Conan picture. The themes were developed before he started shooting. Uh, he's interesting in that he always, he's, he loves motives. And, and he um, insists that he has the major themes before he goes off to shoot. Uh, somehow he, in Conan, I think he actually planned a few camera moves because I had played them on piano. He had a cassette tape of this. And I think he planned a few camera moves. The processional that goes up to the mountain of power in, in the film, uh, he used the, the piano thing for playback so they could get a rhythm for their walking. And I had to utilize almost everything that I knew about music to that point. Um, again, it was a situation that there was no precedent for uh, in terms of its period, its time period is the Hyborian age. Um, like, like science fiction, uh, there, there were, it didn't exist. So it was creating a, a sense of a, of a place. Um, um, he wanted it to sound like the whole film was a ritual that had been waiting 10,000 years to happen. Well, it's kind of the other way around, isn't it? I mean, she co-wrote it with me. Um, yeah. My room was across the hall from where uh, he was writing. Uh, it, was, it was a piece called The Orgy, and um, I had had this idea of uh, a rhythm. And I would hear, the, I would hear the, the rhythm, mostly just the rhythm of the piano keys. And I kept playing it endlessly over and over as I do almost everything that I want to really become familiar with. It was just one thing that went over and over and over and over again. She walked into the, into the room when I was playing one day. I think I was aware of the fact that you were pressured to finish something, because you had a calendar up on the wall. and. It was counting down to when you were going to Rome. And she was playing a recorder. She was studying in school. She was nine years old, mind you. I had just gotten home from school one day. We were playing a uh, recorder in music class. She had this melody going over the top of the, I was playing this rhythmic chord vamp. I just started playing a melody line over this thing that had been ingrained in my head. And all of a sudden, I'm going, this is really pretty good, because I had been searching for something for about a week to, to, um, to glue all this rhythm stuff together with. I think I remember you saying that you really liked it. Mm -hmm. when we were playing it. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't know he was going to use it until we were all over there. Unknown to her, I had it, uh, we orchestrated it for uh, eight French horns, the melody that she was playing on the recorder. She was in Rome when we recorded, and I brought her to the podium when I conducted the piece. And I said, well, I have a surprise. I think you're going to like this. And here it is, and they played it through the rehearsal. A little recorder melody came up on eight French horns, blasting it out, and it was over. And I, to her and I said, what did you think of that? I guess I said that it wasn't right. You didn't get it right, you know. It didn't, the line didn't really go like that. <laughs> you <laughs> you had changed, there was a note that was wrong. And I thought, yes, all right. She has a mind of her own and she knows what she wants. And it's Should I take you on a tour now? So this is the studio. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is the studio <laughs> that you built when um, yeah. we lived here before. It looks really different now. Yeah. It's totally different now. So I, I do remember uh, one night I was trying to come up with the, the, the anvil of Krom as a very specific kind of rhythm because I wanted to get this sense that Conan is like this giant cat prowling the earth, mm. you know, and, and the way he would walk and there's this thing and it's, it's kind of a half, half of a, a, a Greek dance and, and half of a uh, March and um, and I was sitting here banging it out because in those days I was really a pretty good pianist and and loved just to play it over and over and over and all of a sudden it must have been around midnight I had this sense that this thing this hairy thing just sort of came by I mean, it was human it wasn't an animal and and uh, just this massive muscular thing that just went whew, behind me and, and you know I got these chills and and stopped playing and, and looked up and went. Oh God, it's Conan, you know, <laughs> and uh, it's, it, it was really, I mean, it was quite real at the moment. And years later, I asked John Milius, I said, did anything 
strange happened when you were writing Conan? And he goes, oh yeah. And that was it. And I never told him about that. And he never, you know, elaborated on, oh yeah. But uh, it was very real. And uh, that's when I knew that, okay, that's the main title for this movie. One day it was raining and, and uh, my wife and I were driving in this area and I saw this house and I said, that looks interesting and it had a for sale sign on it. Um, we came inside and instantly it reminded me of a boat. So I thought, this is fine, this, this will be quite adequate and also it's rather close to the ocean. I think music is like sailing and I think sailing's like music. There's a certain flow that I've learned from sailing that I've applied to music. There's a kind of a, you know, go where the wind blows you. Uh, I follow my instincts when I'm writing a piece of, of music, very much like, you know, when to tack when you're sailing. The sea, I like the horizontality of it. I like the fact that it's always changing. Uh, no two days are the same. I mean, today, obviously, it's very windy here. It could be a dead calm uh, tomorrow. I need to regenerate somehow in nature. And nature, for me, really isn't the mountains or, or, or fresh water, but it is salt water. Um, uh, there's a kind of a strength, a power, a way of just calming, calming myself out um, that, that I can only get from the ocean. Sailing to me is more of a, an immediate experience. Surfing is stepping back into being 18 years old. But sailing seems to be very present, very much what I am now. I like all the movies I've scored, you know, and, and you don't really think about I mean, I don't choose them because I think they're going to be hits or not. I choose them because I, I can find something to write. For them. The thematic material came very quickly, as in Lonesome Dove. Um, I think I saw, I saw Lonesome Dove uh, and came home that afternoon and sat down and the, and the three main themes for the, for the films were, were there by six o'clock that evening. The same thing happened with Free Willy. What I wasn't sure of is, was whether it would work. I suppose um, uh, Simon also is, is quite taken by melody, so I've been quite fortunate and, and, or obviously directors are attracted to me for that reason, perhaps. Um, but I was unsure about whether we should do that kind of a, uh, it's almost, it's quasi-classical, and, it, and it's, you're right, the ballet is exactly what it, it feels like. Um, and I, but I wasn't sure if he would go for it, so I remember the day he came over and I, I just played it for him very loosely on the piano and he had tears. And I thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe this is it. I, mean, I get to a place that I call very raw, and I'm really unable to make any kind of assessment about what I'm doing. And that's when you have, you know, I really have to rely upon the director. Let me digress a bit. I had this feeling that I started, I grew up with my children in a way, you know. I, I kind of uh, went through their childhood, I suppose, because I was there all the time. I was at home writing it. And um, so there's a kind of a sweetness that they brought to, to my life. Um, softer side and Free Willy kind of uh, played into that. And, uh, but again it was the ocean. Before I would get an assignment, basically go meet with the director, start writing uh, on a piano or, you know, on a, in my case, on a piano. 
Uh, six, six or seven weeks later, get together with the director on the scoring stage and produce the score. There were um, um, uh, heads of music in the, at, the, at the major studios. They would take care of the copying. There would be staff copyists. There would be uh, people who would do the contracting of the orchestras. Um, and all the post-production facilities were there for the music editors. And oftentimes they were attached through by the studio to a project. Um, that's the way it used to be. The way it is today, we can fully produce finished um, uh, mixes of, of films here in this, in this building. Um, there are independent contractors, there are independent music editors, independent copyists. So all of these things need to be, um, uh, one needs to be aware of all the various functions in order to be responsible to some, some budget you know, that every film has. Um, oftentimes we end up doing the payrolling of not, not necessarily the musicians, but of the various subcontractors, engineers, the studios, uh, rental gear that we may need for our mixes. And in the case of Starship Troopers, we did SDDS mixes, which are seven, seven speaker mixes, and that entails a tremendous amount of uh, signal processing gear tape recorders, uh, extra extra things. It's not just a normal three-channel or five-channel mix uh, when you're dealing with seven. It's, it just becomes geometrically more complicated. And what it seems, uh, that's, that's just a real nuts and bolts kind of accounting process that, that needs to be dealt with. Um, I need to be aware of what each one of those functions is and how much they cost, which is something I've never, you know, it's just I'm hired to do a score in the old days, walk in, write the score, and that's it. I get paid a, a fee, and I'm really have never been privy to what the budgets were or what the expenses were. And I would say this has come about in the last three years, where I've really needed to know. Not that I'm packaging, because I, I don't and I won't, but nonetheless, in order to be responsible to a budget, you know, you need to be aware of all the aspects that that, it, uh, that comprise it. Richard Kraft is, is my agent, and and if he's aware of a project that he thinks I would be very good for, he certainly has no hesitation to go in and, and uh, pitch me for it. Whereas I, I would either not be aware that it existed or wouldn't have the nerve to go do it on my own. Obviously, the more films one does, the, the more self-perpetuating it becomes. But there are always uh, producers, um, film companies. I mean, I can't be aware of everything that's going on out there, and that's primarily their function. They also stand as a buffer between the producers and, and the composer. First of all, nothing exists from ancient Greece. I think there are there are scraps, fragments of what the music may have sounded like. So it was really kind of a process of my own uh, remembering what the rhythms were. The, uh, my father used to dance a lot, and uh, um, you know, at parties and gatherings. Um, I've always liked, particularly um, uh, in modern composition, the Greek composers uh, Theodorakis. I've always been a fan of his and um, uh, Xenakis. And so there's the, it was almost a working backwards. Uh, I, would, I, I got some tapes that were recorded in the 30s, and I figured that those probably were pretty close to the way music has been in Greece for a long, long time. I mean, you go to some small village in 1930, there's not a whole lot of association with the outside world in, in that time. Uh, so I did sort of a deconstructionism about what I thought music might have sounded like then, and then plugged in my own childhood memories of, of things and my own um, uh, ideas about what the ancient games must have been like. So I, th I think it, it lent an incredible uh, reality, uh, imagined or otherwise, but at least it was real to me.
My father had uh, passed away about two months before. And I was going to do it sort of as a tribute to him. He became ill and, and uh, died, what, about two months, I think, before the Olympics. So it was with, um, it was very sad, you know, that because uh, it was something that I thought would really be a statement about about him and, and, and uh, his birthplace. and uh, Not that the other films that I've written, you know, that he wasn't very um, taken by them and, and moved by, by the music, but this, this was really more for him as well as me. I got this amazing kind of um, tutoring in Homer. So the Iliad and the Odyssey weren't mythology, I mean they were mythology, but they were more like history. I mean I learned them as the history of Greece as opposed to the stories about the heroes of Greece. Uh, so I think that gave me a, a particular kind of um, uh, identification, uh, not with the modern Greece so much, but with ancient Greece. I mean the, the real heritage of, of uh, the ancient world, um, to which I, I took studying classics, um, and I particularly enjoy doing movies that are about mythology and, um, and, and heroes. It seemed to me that the main characters, and, and all music, all film music, must be driven by what, what the formal dictates of the, of, the, of the drama are. And this one was really about two, two men, Texas Rangers, and very s uncomplicated people. Um, uh, but very straight, very honest, very uh, forthright characters. And the last thing I wanted to do was do something that was so terribly sophisticated that it would play counter to them. Um, I guess more mo I didn't want to do anything that was that modern. I didn't want to reflect from the, the, the 1900s back, back to the 1860s. I wanted to find something that would really feel like it was in the 1860s. And therefore, I, I, um, I didn't base it on any particular folk song, although the, uh, the Texas, I used the Texas Ranger theme when uh, one of the Texas Rangers is carrying the guy's body back to, for burial. Uh, but I wanted it to sound like it, that they were folk songs, that the, that the music grew out of a folk song that might have existed. But I didn't think it was important. I, I tried to downplay the importance of either winning or losing. And when they were reading the names of the nominees is when it started to grow. And when I realized that I had to win this thing, it was terrifying. It was actually a terrifying sensation. Uh, because I could do nothing to affect the outcome, you know, it didn't matter, nothing. Uh, it was an extraordinary experience. I'd say that um, it can start as early as four in the morning if I have an idea I wake up with, which is when I like it, at it and that's at its best. If I've, something's been working out in my subconscious when I'm asleep, it'll pop up, go down before the phone rings, before you know, things start happening. Um, Generally, it's between four and eight. I, I, I do like to get an early start. Um, and that could go for 16, 20 hours. I take short naps. Um, it's, um, it's not so much that it's because I'm tired. It's just a way to, to distance myself from the, the vice-like lock you know, that, that's going through your mind. It just, it just gives me some distance. I dreamt a lot about the movie, but this is, this is what I call when the movie's over dreams, and there's always a cue to write, but you can never remember what the number of the cue is or what the scene is, and, and there's always a fragment of an idea, but it can never be completed, and, and um, that's sort of the recurring dream that I have when I'm finished with a project, and I had the first one last night, so I guess it means that I'm officially finished.
This one was strange, though. Was, you know, my recording engineer and I were, engineer and I were uh, uh, somebody's garage or something, and the uh, guy was trying to sell us clocks, and they were these beautifully mounted little timepieces. So I suspect the whole thing of time running out, or the end of time for this project, all that comes into play. And, and then Paul Verhoeven was supposed to meet us, and, but he arrived by taxi, and he had chocolate cake with him. I don't know. It's one of those things. So there was no place for the taxi to park, so we had to go out and get Paul. And we've always had a, a kind of a seriously bad parking situation at my studio, so I think that has something to do with the parking. I haven't figured out the chocolate cake. Not at all. He's this wonderful ball of, of creative energy, and within that ball is contained all the things that come to mind when you think of art, you know, of the, the gamut of emotions and um, just this, this wealth of, of intuition into an artistic interpretation of life. And, and he's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Really inspirational. Well, I think we love each other a great deal. I think our goals have been pretty much the same. The focus of, of having children, I, th I think, was really something that neither of us had a problem with and, and devoted as much energy and time I think as we've, we could. we've just been, we've been a team from the beginning. Mm -hmm. and. The music was so important, and that, that, was, that was what we, we both focused on. And of course, Basil is home all the time, and he works at home, so we've been together you know, 30 years, but almost every day, all day of the 30 years. Bobby's been more like a partner in the whole thing, um, I mean, aside from the marriage, more, more in, in the career, because working at home, and she's a, a, aware of everything that goes on uh, with it, with whatever's you know, writing a score in tales, uh, all the phone calls, the, the problems, the changes, picture changes. So it's not as if it's, it's a world that she doesn't understand. I think that uh, attributes, uh, we can attribute a lot to that. I don't, I don't endorse smoking. 